Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Discoveries in Revelations Prophecy. My name is Greg Evans, and I'll be your host throughout the series. Our speaker is Mark Finley. Mark is an international speaker, a noted author. He has lectured in over 70 countries throughout the world. He's authored or co-authored over 50 books that I know of, at least. He's also the chair of Hope Channel, and this series is actually being uplinked onto Hope Channel. You'll be able to see it via satellite if you have the Optus B3 or other satellites in your home. He brings a lot of skill and experience into this series. I'd like you now to sit back as we ask Mark to address us this afternoon talking about amazing discoveries in lost cities of the dead. Thank, Thank you, you, Mark. Thank you, Greg. I appreciate so much uh, the opportunity of being here in Melbourne. My wife and I have been looking forward to this for almost two years now. This series has been in the planning. Let me tell you a little bit about the Discovery Series. As you come every night, we're going to explore the great questions of life. Have you ever felt that you have too many questions and too few answers? Have you ever felt that there are basic issues in life that you were seeking for answers for. You're looking for a deeper purpose, deeper meaning in your own life. During the Discovery Series, we're going to look at the great questions of life. Where can you find certainty? Where can you find assurance? Where can you find direction for your life? Is this world facing an enormous crisis? What's just around the corner? What does the future hold? How can you have greater confidence as you face the future. We're going to look at the issues of life and death. Have you ever wondered, is there any life after death? What happens five minutes after death? How can you be certain of eternal life? Or is there eternal life? What does the Bible teach about it? We'll be probing the great future as outlined in the Bible. And as we move through the series, we'll especially look at the book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. We we'll look at topics in Revelation such as, who is the beast? What is the mark of the beast? What about the number 666? We'll look at such topics as the Antichrist in Revelation, the seven last plagues, the time of tribulation. We'll look throughout the book of Revelation for answers for the questions that plague our lives today. My topic this afternoon is amazing discoveries in the lost cities of the dead. Come with me on a journey, a journey of discovery in the ancient lands of the Bible. One of the favorite cities that I have traveled to in the world and often taken tour groups to is the city of Jerusalem. There's something amazing about Jerusalem. There's a spiritual ethos about it. There's an atmosphere about Jerusalem. When you walk through the gates of Jerusalem, it's like stepping back in time. Walking through those gates, you may be greeted by ladies selling their greens right through the gates. You may be greeted by young men hawking their bagels on the street corner. Incidentally, you can smell those bagel carts from meters away, and they attract you to come over and uh, get a little lunch or at least get a snack. The bagels are some of the most delicious, delightful that you can get any place in the world. You may be walking along the side of uh, the Hasidic Jews or some other Orthodox Jew, or you may be at the marketplace and be haggling with an Arab about the price of a jacket or the price of a blouse or the price, price of a shirt. You know, the Arab traders in the marketplaces of Jerusalem certainly don't feel that they have had a day's work unless they've been able to negotiate. If you go to Jerusalem, and I always tell my tour group people this, if you go to Jerusalem and you do not argue and haggle about the price of what you're buying, the Arab traders will be very, very disappointed in you, and they won't feel that they've made a sale even if they make it at full price. One thing for certain, though, be absolutely sure that if you enter into some negotiation with the Arab traders that you are prepared to buy. It's the highest insult to negotiate and not to buy. 
Jerusalem is the center of three great world religions. It's the center of Christianity, the center of Judaism, and the center of Islam. Christianity had its roots 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. It was here that Jesus walked the cobblestone streets. It was here that Jesus taught. It was here that Jesus was tried. It was here that Jesus carried the cross, walked up Golgotha's hill, and eventually died. If you were at Jerusalem during the time of Easter, you may be carried along on the throngs with other worshipers as you follow the Via Della Rosa, the way of the cross. So Jerusalem is the center of the Christian faith. It's also the center of the Jewish faith. The Western Wall is the holiest shrine of the Jewish world. Now, when we use the term the Western Wall, we are describing the wall of the temple, the temple at Jerusalem that was destroyed in 70 AD. Now, there were two temples, the temple that Solomon built that was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the temple that Herod built that, for the Jews that was subsequently destroyed in 70 AD. All that is left of that magnificent temple, all that's left of that splendor and wonder of the temple is this western wall. It's the portion of the wall that Herod built around the second temple period in 20 BC. Now, when you go there today, you'll note that right above that wall is the al Aska Mosque on Temple Mount, the very place that the Jewish temple once sat. You can understand why, as our Jewish friends come to this Western Wall, they come with sadness in their hearts. They think of the glory. They think of the splendor. They think of the magnificence of another era. They think of the glory of Israel as it has now passed by. And they're longing for that glory to return as they come to the wall. As they come, they often come and touch the wall as if they are touching the magnificence of centuries in the past. You'll note here little pieces of paper rolled up on mini scrolls placed in the wall. What are these mini scrolls? What is this paper? Prayers. Prayers that God will restore Israel to its past glory. Children, 12 years old, when they make their bar mitzvah, come here to this wall, recite the prayers of the Old Testament, and pray to God that he'll restore the glory of Israel. But as our Jewish friends come to the wall, there is a section both for men and women. The women are not allowed to come to the same section of the wall as men come. But as they look up just above that wall, they notice the golden domed rock, the golden dome mosque, the Alaska Mosque, the Dome of the Rock. This Dome of the Rock is built on Mount Moriah, the former site of the Jewish temple complex. So you can just understand, if you're a Jew, and if you come to that temple site, you look up and you see the holiest shrine of all of Islam. And you can sense that there'll be an anger that develops in your heart. There'll be this desire to see that temple gone. There'll be this desire to see the Jewish temple built on that very spot. So regularly there's conflict. I remember some time ago when I was there, there were uh, Arab worshipers. They were taking stones from the higher vantage point of the al As Mosque and throwing them down on the worshipers at the wall. And the Israeli police had to come and break it up with tear gas. This Dome of the Rock was built at the end of the seventh century. It took all of the caliph's taxes from his province in Egypt for seven years to finance the building. It's one of the most magnificent buildings in the world. Any place you are in Jerusalem, you notice the sun dancing and gleaming off that golden dome. You notice the thousands and thousands and thousands of pieces of blue glazed tile, all set in by hand on this magnificent mosque. Truly today, it's one of the seven wonders of the world. When you enter the mosque, you will note clearly the marble columns. Now, the fascinating thing about these marble columns is they're not the typical white marble. As you can see from the picture, there is black 
lines and black runs of marble through the white on some columns. Other columns are almost all black. It's a very rare, very exquisite marble that's used. You'll notice the carpets are absolutely magnificent, very, very carefully, exquisitely done designs on the carpeting. Jerusalem, though, the city of peace, has become the center of conflict. This center of three great world religions, this center of Christianity, this center of Judaism, this center of Islam, has become the center of conflict. Through the millennia, Jerusalem's been attacked by the Babylonians. It's been attacked by the Assyrians, by the Egyptians, by the Romans, by the Turks, and a host of others. Yes, Jerusalem has been the site of bloodshed down through the years. I used to take tour groups here and not think very much about it. It was a magnificent place to go and visit the sites and the scenes of Jesus' life and ministry. But today, I'm a little more cautious as I take these tour groups here. Because you never know when you might be in the street and come across a scene like this, cars backed up, the uh, fire brigade and ambulance brigade going to a cafe where a bomb has exploded and uh, there are many people dead. Or you might come across a bus that has just been blown up by a suicide bomber. Today, Jerusalem is far more dangerous than it was a few years ago. People are concerned today when they think about Jerusalem when they think about the Middle East, they looked out of the closed windows of their lives and they wonder, are we on the verge of World War III? Will the conflict in Jerusalem explode into World War III? What is on the horizon? What will take place in the future? What is coming? Many people believe the conflict in the Middle East will erupt into a global battle. They're convinced that the Arab-Israeli conflict will explode into a third world war. The Washington Post, February 23, 2003, talking about the conflict in the Middle East, and particularly America's war with Iraq, made this provocative statement. World destabilizing aggression could spin out of control and lead to other despots arming themselves with all manner of apocalyptic weapons and perhaps to Armageddon. The term Armageddon is being used more and more in our world today when it comes to the Middle East and what potentially could happen. A psychologist in Newsweek magazine, March 3, 2003, again commenting on what's happening in the Middle East said, the terrible consequences of an unjustified preemptive strike will turn a billion Muslims into enemies when we might have lived in peace. It will be a step toward Armageddon. Thinking people are concerned. Politicians are concerned. Sociologists are concerned. Psychologists are concerned. Religious leaders are concerned. Where is this world headed? Are we headed to Armageddon? Are we headed to Earth's last war? What does the future hold? Will we see a conflict in, erupt in the Middle East that will be uncontrollable? Many people think, thinking people are asking questions. What does the future hold? What's next? Where is this world headed? And there's a lot in the world today to be concerned about. There's a lot in our world that troubles us. There's a lot in the world that thinking people are greatly agitated and troubled by. Think of global warming, for example. The polar ice caps are melting. Recently, a major ice cap has broken off, and a major glacier is out in the sea floating. Global warming is causing the change of weather patterns around the world. Some parts of the world, there are great droughts. Certainly in Africa, you have the spread of the deserts. The Sahara seems to be spreading as the result of global warming. If global warming continues and the polar ice caps melt, will the tides rise and the coastal cities be destroyed? There's been an unprecedented series of worldwide natural disasters recently. There have been famines, 
and earthquakes and fires and floods. There have been typhoons and tsunami disasters. What does this mean? Where is our world headed? There are some who are concerned that maybe an asteroid will strike planet Earth as planet Earth travels on its journey through the space. And as we travel through the sky, there are thousands and thousands of asteroids. Could it be that a colossal asteroid will strike planet Earth and end all life on planet Earth? Global international conflicts seem to be becoming more unpredictable particularly because of the fact that nations like North Korea and Iran are attempting to build a nuclear bomb. Where are we headed? Are we on the verge of disaster? Is there something just around the corner that's great and decisive that's going to take place? Will we be threatened by, with the use of nuclear weapons? What if terrorists got a hold of nuclear weapons? weapons? What if terrorists use nuclear weapons to threaten some nuclear attack? And what about worldwide famine when you consider the fact that world hunger is uh, spinning out of control? The world is having more and more mouths to feed and less and less food to feed those mouths. The world population is burgeoning. It's exploding. Yet it seems that we have less and less food and more people are dying of famine. Since the world is interconnected through its computerization and global technology, through its technological advances, could we face a world financial collapse, a world stock market collapse? Where can we find reliable answers regarding the future? How can we face the future with greater confidence? Can you begin to see that the average person in Australia the average person throughout Europe and around the world is in a state of quandary. The average person is asking too many questions and they don't have reliable answers. In the desperate search for answers, there are some people that are turning to bizarre and very strange avenues and sources of information. The psychic world is exploding today. Many secular, unchurched people who have turned from the Bible are turning to the psychic world for answers. But is the answer that the psychics give, is that reliable? Are these answers trustworthy? A friend of mine, an editor of a religious magazine, formerly known as These Times, wrote an article called Supermarket Psychics, Spin the Roulette Wheel Again. He's speaking about these tabloid newspapers that publish the predictions of the psychics. And he's, he researched carefully 250 specific published predictions of the psychics. And this is what he said. We found less than 3%, that is 6 out of 250, that we could list as reasonably fulfilled, and 97%, 244, that missed the mark completely. Here are six predictions out of 250, 93% that missed the mark completely. I'm no psychic, certainly, but I think I could guess better than that. If I had 250 predictions, I think I could guess and I'd get more than 6 out of 250 right. And ladies and gentlemen, you're not psychic either. And you could probably guess more than 6 times and get them right. Obviously, the psychics simply let people down. Here's Nostradamus, a French psychic, who made this prediction. This is a translation of an ancient prophecy. Clashes among racial, ethnic, and nationalistic groups in Eastern Europe. Climax with the use of nuclear weapons. Well, obviously, that was supposed to happen around the year 2000. It never happened. Here is another one by Edgar Cayce, who died a number of years ago, called The Sleeping Prophet. His books have a resurgence today, and they're growing in sales. There'll be a major financial crash in January of 2000. Vicious ice and electrical storms will rake the United States and Western Europe, killing a million or more senior citizens and other innocent people who lost their homes or incomes in the January crash. Well, this was supposed to happen about 2000. Of course, it never happened. Nothing remotely like it happened. Ladies and gentlemen, 
We live in a world of people looking for answers. We live in a world that many sociologists and politicians say is on the verge of Armageddon. We live in a world where people are turning to the psychics, but the psychics are letting them down. Where can we turn for reliable answers? Unlike the failed predictions of the psychics, the Bible has been accurate for 3,500 years. We can have confidence in an ancient book, for as the years pass, its predictions become more accurate. With each passing year, the Bible gains more credibility. With each unearthing of a new archaeological discovery, the Bible becomes more credible and more reliable. That's why more and more thinking people are turning to the word of the living God. Fulfilled Bible prophecy reveals the truthfulness of God's word and gives us confidence that the future is not in the hands of man, but the future is in the hands of God. Let's look tonight at some of these amazing prophecies. Isaiah chapter 46, verse 9 and 10. The Bible says, remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. Now why is he God and there is no other? Why can he say I am God and there is none like me? For this reason, he declares the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. There is only one that can declare the end from the beginning. There's only one that can declare from ancient times things that are not yet done. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, the God who created the world is the architect of the future. The future is really in his hands. Let's look tonight at those discoveries that help to bring credibility to the Bible. Come with me on a journey to the fascinating lands of the Middle East and discover the reliability of an ancient book. We begin in the magnificent land of the Nile. The Nile River flows from the mountains in Africa, flows across the African plain, down through Egypt. And as the Nile flows through Egypt, it develops what is called the Abyssinian Carpet. This is a fertile valley. In fact, most of Egypt, more than 97%, lives within a few kilometers of the Nile River. Along the Nile, you have these lush oases, magnificent date palms. Egypt was one of the greatest civilizations ever to grace planet Earth. It was one of the greatest civilizations ever to exist. Look at the fascinating and magnificent pyramids. Consider the fantastic treasures of Egypt. Egypt, when you see the exquisite artwork, the carvings, the gold overlaid thrones, when you look at the awesome monuments of Egypt, you stand back in awe and wonder of its ancient temples, truly one of the greatest societies in the then known world. The Egyptian culture was indeed a fascinating culture. It was a culture of brilliant architects, mag of, of engineers, of mathematicians and artisans. You would have had to be incredibly brilliant to build the pyramids. Blocks of rocks, many tons with no cement, fitted together perfectly with no variations even at a fraction of a centimeter. When you look at the pyramids, they are as if they are one unit. And you ask yourself the question, how did these rocks get rolled in place? Were they rolled as columns and then cut? But how did they get there when these rocks of multiple tons uh, do not exist in that area, but were quarried from many kilometers away? You ask yourself, how were these many toned uh, blocks lifted up to such magnificent heights? Certainly, the Egyptians must have been brilliant architects, engineers, mathematicians, and artisans. The Egyptians had a strong belief in the afterlife, and that is why they built the pyramids, and they buried the pharaoh's almost entire treasure with him so he could enjoy his wealth in the afterlife. They believed that there was the Ba and the Ka, and the Ba would leave the body at death and come back searching for the Ka, and so they tried to make the death masks very, very accurate, so they looked like the exact 
a face or replica of the Egyptian pharaoh that died. They were committed to preserving a record of their exploits for future generations, and of course that's why they wrote on their monuments with hieroglyphics. The pyramids at Giza and the plains of Giza required 2.5 million blocks of stone. It's just stunning when you think about it. The great pyramid Cheops at Giza towered over 480 feet. That is well over 180 meters high. It's spread over 13 acres. That's higher than a 10-story building. Some of the blocks weighed between 1.5 and 3 tons each. One of the wonders of the then known world. But have you ever asked yourself, if indeed the Giza pyramids took 120,000 workers 20 years to build, and if this was one of the most magnificent cultures, whatever happened to the splendor? Whatever happened to the wealth? Whatever happened to the magnificence of Egypt? Where has all this gone? Come with me back now. Back to an ancient prophecy. For 500 years, Memphis was the capital of the city of Egypt. Memphis was the center of idolatry with thousands and thousands of Egyptian idols. Here is the great alabaster sphinx of Egypt. But today the sphinx of, is in ruins. Today Memphis is in ruins. You wander around among the broken down images. You wander around among the stones and the ruins and you say, where was the civilization of past society that was so splendorous and magnificent? The Bible said in Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 13, thus says the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols and cause the images to cease from Namph. Naph was another name for Memphis. God said that the idols of Memphis would be destroyed and this great city would be destroyed. Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 12, by the swords of the mighty warriors, all of them the most terrible of the nations, I will cause your multitude, that's Egypt's multitude, to fall. They shall plunder the pomp of Egypt and all the, is, its multitude shall be destroyed. They'll plunder the pomp. When many of the archaeologists uncovered the graves of Egypt, they discovered that the plunderers had already been there and the pomp, the wealth, the magnificence of those graves was gone. The Bible said Egypt would be destroyed. It would be as a desolate place. The Bible said that the temples would be crushed down. The Bible said the plunder of Egypt would be uh, taken away and its pomp would be carted off into other nations. You visit those temples today, those temples that were once so magnificent, and the splendor is gone, the wealth is gone, the pomp is gone. Ezekiel chapter 30, verse 15 says, when I make the land of Egypt desolate, and the country is destitute of all that once fulfilled it, indeed it is, today it's destitute of all that once fulfilled it. Amelia Edwards is an Egyptologist. She visited Memphis, and as she did, she made this insightful comment. She was talking about the desecration, the destruction of the temples at Memphis, talking about the idols on the ground, and she said, where are the stately ruins, which even in the Middle Ages extended over the space of half a day's journey in each direction? One can hardly believe that a great city flourished on this spot, or understand how it should have been effaced so completely. Amelia Edwards, the famous Egyptologist said, how do you understand? How do you understand that the ruins of Egypt that were scattered for a half a day's journey are now gone? The ruins are all plundered. How do you understand that? Because Bible prophecy predicted that Egypt would be desolate. Bible prophecy predicted that the idols of Egypt would fall, that its wealth would be carted away, and that it would never retain its splendor again. You wander through the deserts of Egypt. You look at the pyramids that are eroding in time, the weather-beaten pyramids that show their age. And just as the Bible predicted, Egypt is a barren land. The dynasties of the past are lost in the wind-swept sands of the desert. These ancient predictions from the scriptures are extremely specific. They reveal the future of empires, they reveal the future of cities, and they reveal the future of rulers. Come with me further north. 
We'll travel to the old seaport city of Tyre. One of the greatest prophecies in all the Bible is the prophecy of Tyre. Now, to understand that prophecy, we need to understand a little bit of background about Tyre. Tyre was an ancient seaport city that was situated in the country of Lebanon. It was actually in southern Lebanon. You may remember the recent skirmish, recent war between the Israelis and, and Lebanon and the Hezbollah in Lebanon. A lot of the rockets were fired uh, in the area of old Tyre and to and from that area. Tyre grew in importance in biblical times until she was the mistress of the sea, the commercial center of the world. Tyre was really a magnificent city. Carthage, the rival of Rome, was only a colony of Tyre. What a city. Fantastic in its magnificence. Tyre was a thriving city. It stretched 20 miles, or it stretched about 35 to 40 kilometers along the shore. Seven miles, or 11, 12 kilometers, were densely populated. They were built up with very, very large buildings. Ships from all nations anchored in Tyre's harbor. Merchants bartered in her streets. Ships from India brought spices. Ships from the area of China brought silk. Ships from Europe brought art and fabulous uh, statues. From Turkey, carpets were made and shipped to Tyre. Israel provided fruits, and so you could buy anything in Tyre. It was the Paris of its day. It was the London of its day. It was the Sydney of its day. It was the Los Angeles of its day. Or maybe it was the Singapore of its day. It was a commercial shopping center that everything that delighted the eye and tempted the taste could certainly be bought there. But the Bible said in Ezekiel 26, verse 4, they shall destroy the walls of Tyre. They shall break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her, make her like the top of a rock. I want you to see the specificity of this prophecy. Tyre would be destroyed. It would be scraped like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading nets in the midst of the sea. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. Did you notice the prophecy? Tyre would be destroyed. It would be scraped like at the top of a rock. It would be a place for fishermen's nets where they'd be spread. And it would be no more forever. Now this is quite a bold prophecy to make. Many cities have been destroyed. London was destroyed in the Second World War, but rebuilt. Jerusalem has been destroyed many times, but rebuilt. Frankfurt, Germany, destroyed by the Allied bombers, but rebuilt. So many cities have been destroyed, but they've always been rebuilt. The Bible says Tyre would be destroyed, old Tyre, and never rebuilt again. It would be the place for a spreading of nets. It would become a horror. Now, the Bible says, chapter 26 of Ezekiel, verse 12 to 14, they will plunder your wealth and loot your merchandise. They will break down your walls, demolish your houses. They'll throw your stones, timber, and rubble into the sea. You'll never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, declares Sovereign Lord. So this is quite an amazing prophecy. It's very exact. Now, here are the five aspects of the prophecy. The Bible predicted that the Babylonian ruler Nebuchadnezzar would attack the city of Tyre. Other nations would come against it as well. Tyre would become bare like the top of a rock. Fishermen would spread their nets over the site. Tyre would be cast into the water and never rebuilt. Now, here's how that prophecy was fulfilled. This is quite amazing. Shortly after Ezekiel's prediction, Nebuchadnezzar did attack the city. And he destroyed it just like the Bible predicted. But there was one problem. He didn't scrape it like the top of a rock. He didn't cast its ruins in the middle of the sea. For 200 years, it looked like the prophecy would be broken. It looked like that prophecy wouldn't be fulfilled. Tyre was destroyed, but the other aspects of the prophecy were not, not uh, they didn't happen. It took 13 years for Nebuchadnezzar to fully destroy that city. The city lay in ruins for 250 years, two and a half centuries. 250 years later, the prophecy was fulfilled in 333 B.C., when Alexander the Great scraped the ruins of old Tyre to build a causeway to attack new Tyre built on an island half a mile away. Now, let me explain it to you. It's amazing. Old Tyre was destroyed. They built new Tyre on a little island 
that was about a half a mile away. Alexander came down and he saw this uh, new city some one kilometer off the coast. And he said, we've got to attack it. And so he scraped old Tyre and all the ruins from old Tyre that Nebuchadnezzar had left on the ground. Alexander scraped them all off, threw them into the sea, built a causeway so his soldiers could march across this human bridge out to New Tyre to destroy it. The prophecy was fulfilled to its minutest detail. Bible prophecy does not guess, it knows. Now let's travel further south to make a stop in the desert, not far from Beersheba, the home of Abraham. Now the Bible prophets, the Israeli prophets, Isaiah and Jeremiah predicted Nebuchadnezzar's attack on Jerusalem. They predicted that Nebuchadnezzar would not only attack Tyre and destroy it, which he did, scrape like a top of a rock, exactly like the Bible said, place of fishermen nets, exactly like the Bible said, but not only did the Bible predict that Nebuchadnezzar would attack Tyre, but it predicted he would attack Jerusalem. This is what the Bible said, Jeremiah 27, verse 6. Now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beast of the fields I have also given to him. And the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, who fight against this city, Jerusalem, shall come up and set fire and burn it. So according to the Bible, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian armies would come and attack Jerusalem. Is there any record outside the Bible that helps to verify the authenticity of the Bible that this happened? Is there any historical record outside the Bible that Nebuchadnezzar and his armies attacked Jerusalem? This record is clear. That's why you and I, in our imagination and in our mind's eye, are traveling north of Bathsheba, the home of Abraham. We're traveling to an amazing archaeological discovery, a discovery that helps to confirm the reliability of the Bible. In, from 1932 to 1938, 25 miles north of Beersheba, southern Israel, there was a discovery that is amazing. This discovery, called the Lachish Letters, describes the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem in 587 B.C. So the spade of the archaeologists that uncovers the Lachish letters. Now, when we say Lachish letters, we're not talking about letters that were written from one lover to another on paper. The ancients often wrote in stone to be preserved. And these Lachish letters are documents written on tablets. And uh, these documents confirm the attack of Nebuchadnezzar on Jerusalem, just like the Bible says. Now, one of the most significant recent discoveries that confirms the history of Israel and the reign of King David was unearthed at Tel Dan in northern Israel. So we are in the south of Beersheba, but now we need to go to Tel Dan in the north. Many scholars said that the story of the Bible was a story of myths. They actually said that David, King David of Israel, was a mythical figure. They said he never actually existed, kind of like King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, just a fictitious story. They said if King David was such a magnificent king, he would have been mentioned outside the Bible. Now, the Bible is very clear that David was king of Israel. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 13 says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. The Bible talks about Samuel coming and anointing David as king of Israel with oil. But the scholar said, this is a fictitious tale. This is not accurate. There was no King David. The archaeologists were digging at a place called Tel Dan, northern Israel. They were digging outside the gate. And to the amazement of those archaeologists, they unearthed an inscription of David, king of Israel. And here it is. It's called the David Stila, or David Steda, however, however you choose to pronounce it, David Stila. And it has the inscription of David as king of Israel. No reputable scholar today or archaeologist denies the existence of King David. The times, the places, the dates, the cities in the Bible, through prophecy, through archaeology, are being confirmed today. 
If you're looking for answers in your life, if you're looking for answers regarding the future, the Bible is reliable. For the last 2,000 years of Christian history, the teachings of Scripture have been accurately documented. Prophecies in both the Old and New Testament, many of them written 2,500, 3,000, 4,000 years in advance, have come and are coming true. There is a book that provides reliability, a book that gives us confidence at the end time. Biblical Archaeology Review, March and April, 1994, page 26, talking about this fantastic find set. In 1993, a dramatic find confirmed the historicity of David, king of Israel. A team of archaeologists digging in northern Galilee found a remarkable inscription from the 9th century BC that refers both to the house of David and to the king of Israel, David, found at Dan. The Bible is accurate. It is reliable today. This discovery was so sensational, it made the front page of the New York Times. The inscription also shows that Israel and Judah were important kingdoms in the ninth century. Archaeology and prophecy confirm that ancient book. Here's an amazing uh, discovery that helps us to understand again the accuracy of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 1. In the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, when Sargon, the king of Assyria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. Now, you just read that, and you don't pay much attention to it. But wait a minute. The Bible talks about Sargon, the king of Assyria. The critics said, in all of the king records of Assyria, there was no Sargon. He never existed. So they used this as an argument against the Bible. The absence of evidence is not evidence for absence. In other words, merely because you haven't discovered something doesn't mean the thing you haven't discovered doesn't exist. Paul Bota was excavating at a place called Korsabad. And as he was excavating, what do you think he discovered? He discovered Sargon's palace, a magnificent palace. Indeed, this is Sargon's palace, Wingbull, found today in the in the British Museum. There is no reputable scholar today that denies the existence of Sargon. Again, the spate of the archaeologists confirmed the truthfulness of the Bible. Here is the king record that has been discovered in the Akkadian language describing and naming King Sargon. Come with me, though, to one of my favorite places in all the world. When I travel to Jerusalem, one of the places that I want to go is down along the Dead Sea to the lowest point on Earth. This is 394 meters or 1,291 feet below sea level, here at the world's lowest point at the Dead Sea. Not far from the Dead Sea, actually on the shores of the Dead Sea, is Qumran. The Qumran community it was a community of people called the Essenes. They were a sect of Jews that left Jerusalem. They were very conservative, and they were concerned about the Bible. They were concerned about accu accurately copying the Bible. So this is the Essene community, the ruins of it along the banks of the Dead Sea. And these Essenes hand-copied the scriptures here in this scriptorium. They had very strict copying rules. One copyist would copy. Another would view him copying and check up on his work. They read one another's work back and forth. They copied all of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. As they carefully copied with their fine pens, they wanted to preserve a record of the Bible for future generations. They knew if the Bible was lost, it may be lost for their future generations. In a few, a few, hundred year, a few years rather before Christ, 140 B.C., decades before Christ, these Essenes sensed that an attack was coming. And they hid their precious scrolls in nearby mountain caves. In 1948, a young Arab boy by the name of Mohammed El Adib was, keep, was keeping watch over his father's sheep. As he was, as the story goes, one of the sheep got away. And the boy was looking for the sheep, so he was looking for it on one of these mountain passes, and one of the sheep apparently went into a cave. 
The little boy took a rock and he threw it into the cave, trying to chase the sheep out. He heard the breaking of pottery. He thought immediately, this must be some treasure. There's a pot. Some trader has hid it here in silver and gold. And so the boy ran home, got his father. Father, father, I think we found treasure. I think we found it in the cave. Father, come quickly. His father came back and they did find a treasure. It wasn't silver or gold. Manuscripts. Manuscripts. The father looked at them, didn't quite understand what they were, knew they were ancient and old writings. As the father did, finally began to barter a sale. And, he, and the scrolls were eventually sold to Arab traders who brought them to Bethlehem. Now, the, the scrolls were discovered, really, in 1947. By the time they got to Bethlehem, it was 1948. And in 1948, the uh, British partitioned off the uh, city of Jerusalem, and Bethlehem went to the Arabs. And uh, the uh, Jews heard, Yagel Yadin, one of the great Jewish archaeologists, heard that there were some scrolls out in Bethlehem. Just after the petition, he risked his life, went out there and got the scrolls, brought them back. These scrolls contained, can you believe it, every book in the Old Testament, with the possible exception of Esther. I say the possible exception because even today we think they're fragments of Esther. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, they're all through the Old Testament. Now, not all of the books uh, were complete. But the book of Isaiah, for example, was complete. There were fragments of some of those books. In the providence of God, these scrolls were preserved. Why are they significant? Because we can take the Bible in our hand today. We can look back, say, at the book of Isaiah in the Bible today, and we can look back to the Dead Sea Scrolls. And we can say, let's look at Isaiah in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Is this the same as the Isaiah that we have today? We can take our modern Bible, we can compare it to those scrolls, and we can know that there is no significant difference at all. The scrolls today are housed in the shrine of the book in Israel. These scrolls are some of the most precious finds, probably the greatest archaeological find ever. Why? Because they help to confirm that there has been no change through the copying of the Bible down through the ages. They help to confirm the authenticity and reliability of the Bible. Dr. Cleason Archer, a, a renowned uh, biblical scholar and student, said this, two copies of Isaiah found in the caves proved to be word for word identical with the standard Hebrew Bible in more than 95% of the text. He then went on to say, the 5% variation consisted chiefly of obvious slips of the pen and variations of spelling. When you copy something again and again and again and again, you may get a little slip of the pen. But Dr. Gleason says 95% accuracy and that which is a little slip of the pen does not make any difference significantly at all. He goes on. Of the 166 words in Isaiah 53, there are only 17 letters in the Kimran scroll that differ from the standard Masoretic text. 17 letters is all in this sample that differed, and it didn't make any difference at all. Ladies and gentlemen tonight, are you looking for answers in your life? Are you looking for meaning in your life? Are you looking for purpose in your life? Maybe you have drifted away from God's word. Maybe at one time you've had confidence in God's word. Maybe at one time you were brought up as a child for belief, but you've drifted far, far away. If there's anything, that there's intellectual evidence that it's accurate, because of its pro prophetic predictions that have come true, and because of its archaeological discoveries, and because of its historical accuracy. The Bible is historically accurate. The Bible is archaeologically accurate. The Bible is prophetically accurate. Down through the centuries, the Word of God has indeed been preserved. As uh, the biblical archaeologist said, number 10, pages 60 and 61, there are minor omissions and additions. But the remarkable fact is that there is nothing that can be called a major addition or omission, that is, to the Bible. These are God-inspired writings. The Bible was copied numerous times. The, Maser, the uh, Essenes copied it 140 years after Christ. What about the next major copy of the Bible? The Maserites copied from between 750 and 1000 AD. The Masoretic text is a hand-copied text, and the Maserites lived uh, approximately 850 years plus after the Essenes. Well, what if we took this Masoretic text that's uh, 850 years after the Essene text in the Dead Sea Scrolls and compared the two of them? Now, one of the interesting things is we have discovered the Maserite copying rules. If you are a Maserite copying, and let's suppose you're going to copy the 119th Psalm, 
Before you ever begin to copy, you have to count every letter in the psalm. Let's suppose there are 10,000 letters. That's a long psalm. And then you have to count each word. Let's suppose there are 400 words. And then you have to count to the middle letter. Let's say it's J. And then you have to count to the middle word. Let's say the middle word is Jehovah. And so you have to count every letter. You have to count every word. You have to count to the middle letter. You have to count to the middle word. You have to copy the text carefully comparing with the original. You have to check the number of letters and the number of words after you copy Psalm 119. You have to have somebody read it for you. You have to check every word accurately. Then you have to come back and count every letter. Then you have to count every word. If you don't have the exact word count, you have to, don't have the same letter count. No erasures or corrections are allowed. You must destroy the entire text and rebegin. The Bible says, Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, you can have confidence in this book. This book is not a book of myths. This book is not a book of fables. This book is not a book simply of human opinion. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. The Gutenberg Bible was printed in 1456, the first book printed with movable type coming off the press in Mainz, Germany, was the Gutenberg Bible. So you can take the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Essene text, you can compare it with the Masoretic text 850 years later. You can compare it with the Gutenberg Bible in 1456. You can compare that with modern biblical translations. And you find that there is a straight line of accuracy. Psalm 12, verse 6 says, the words of the Lord are pure words. As a as gold tried in the fire and purified seven times. Thou wilt preserve them, O Lord, from this generation forever. God has preserved his word. The ancient rock records are crying out, God has preserved his word. Ancient archaeology and modern archaeology are crying out, God has preserved his word. History is crying out, God has preserved his word. Prophecy is crying out, God has preserved his word. John Greenleaf Whittier wrote a magnificent poem in which he said, we search the world for truth. We call the good, the pure, the beautiful. From graven stone and written scroll and all the old flower fields of the soul and weary seeker of the best, we come back laden from our quest to find that all the sages said is in the book our mothers read. Ladies and gentlemen, the wisdom of the ages is in the Bible. But the Bible is not like any other book. You see, other books may be enlightening, enlightened, but the Bi- other books may be enlightening, but the Bible's enlightened. The other books may be inspiring, but the Bible's inspired. Other books may carry the thoughts of men, but the Bible carries the power of God. I have seen God's word change and transform lives. You never can go on a journey of faith. You never can go on a journey of discovery without the Bible transforming your life. I was speaking at the great Kremlin Auditorium in the former Soviet Union. Thousands were coming to the meetings. 6,500 to the first session, 6,500 to the second session. I spoke on God's word. I spoke on the power of the living God to change and transform lives. After the first session, I was sitting in my little study getting ready for the second session. The door opened. A huge man walked in, over two meters tall, muscular man. He introduced himself. He was the Russian general that led in the Afghan invasion. As he came in, he said, Mr. Finlay, communism has fallen. Mr. Finlay, this has been an atheistic society, but look at our morality. We have some of the highest suicide rates in the world. We have some of the highest alcoholism rates in the world. 
We are as a country now after the fall of communism that has lost our direction and lost our purpose. But you have talked to us tonight about finding moral direction, finding purpose, finding meaning in the Word of God. Mr. Finley, I want to say to you, I met after your meeting with a group of Russian academics and intellectuals, and we listened to the lecture, and to us, there is only one way forward, and that is a clarity of understanding God's Word and sensing its power in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight, there's power in the old book. If you will come to these meetings night after night, there's power in this book. God will change your life. There will be new insights. You'll have a new understanding. There'll be a new purpose in your life. And you will sense God speaking to your heart. Tonight, would you like to bow your head with me and say, Dear Lord, dear Lord, I want to give my life to you. Lord, I want to follow you. Lord, tonight, I want to go on that journey of discovery into the ancient book to discover deeper purpose for my life. Father in heaven, as we bow our heads just now, we want to thank you. Thank you for the book. Thank you for the word of God. Thank you that the Bible speaks to our hearts. Thank you that scripture gives us new direction and purpose. Tonight we've seen that the psychics have simply failed. We've seen that the psychics have let us down. Tonight we have seen that the word of God is accurate, that history verifies the word of God, prophecy verifies the word of God, archeology span verifies the word of God. Lead us on this journey of discovery and may it be a life changing journey for us, we pray thee, in Christ's name, amen. Thank you so much for coming today. Now let me tell you a little bit about our presentation in our lecture uh, next time. Next time, my topic is, where is this world headed? The dream of an ancient king in the Middle East. We're going to look at the rise and fall of empires. We're going to study a great prophecy in Daniel, the second chapter. You will not want to miss this presentation. I look forward to seeing you next time. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us.